Good evening, and it's great to have you with us here on a Tuesday night, and we have a lot to get to. We begin tonight with the frightening moments in South Florida today. The powerful earthquake, they felt it in Miami, a 7.7 .7 magnitude quake erupting along the same fault line that's affected Puerto Rico in recent weeks. The epicenter between Cuba and Jamaica, and you can see the school children here in Kingston, Jamaica, hiding under their desks. In Miami, workers evacuated from downtown high rises, gathering in parking lots until they could be sure that the buildings were safe. There was a tsunami warning in the region for a time, and the concern tonight, that same fault line that's already been active. ABC's Victor Akendo leads us off from Miami. Tonight, people evacuating from buildings in Miami as a massive 7.7 .7 magnitude earthquake in the Caribbean rattles parts of the city. The alarm started sounding and they were told us to go downstairs to the stairs. We thought it was a bombing, we thought it was a shooting, we didn't know what, what it was. The earthquake's epicenter, more than 400 miles away, off the coast of Jamaica and Cuba. School children hiding under desks in Jamaica, 77 miles from the epicenter. Others evacuated in Kingston. Big earthquake going on, look at this. In nearby Cayman Islands, the pool water seen rattling. <laughs> the last month has been an extremely active period for earthquakes in the Caribbean. Today's quake comes just two weeks after a series of devastating earthquakes in Puerto Rico, which sits along the same tectonic plates. And Victor, as you reported, they felt the effects of that powerful quake right there in Miami, where you're reporting tonight. And I know there have been aftershocks in the zone. That's right, David. A series of them, the strongest being a 6.1. There was also a tsunami threat in the Caribbean and Central America. Thankfully, here in Miami, no one was injured. David. All right, Victor Akendo tonight. Victor, thank you. The explosion of confirmed cases abroad has prompted American officials to increase screening of passengers traveling from China. CDC has reassessed its entry strategy and decided to expand to screening travelers from the five airports originally to 20 airports in the United States. Tuesday, Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar said the U.S. has offered to send a team to China to collect data and help control the spread, but the offer has fallen flat. We are urging China. More cooperation and transparency are the most important steps you can take toward a more effective response. But in Beijing Tuesday, during a meeting with the director of the World Health Organization, President Xi Jinping said China is ready to work with the international community. This is a major, major issue, major public health issue, and we basically just need the best public health people we have in the world working on this right now. The CDC has recommended Americans avoid travel to China, the State Department issuing a stronger level four warning to stay away. Right now, there is no spread of this virus in our communities here at home. This is why our current assessment is that the immediate health risk of this new virus to the general public is low in our nation. Health officials hope it stays that way and are prepared if it doesn't. We have already started at the NIH and with many of our collaborators on the developing of a vaccine. Preparedness is a day job around here. Even though CDC Director Robert Redfield says there's a lot we don't know about the coronavirus still, including exactly how it spread. This is not a public health emergency here in the United States as of now, but Secretary Azar says he would not hesitate to make that designation if it becomes necessary. In the meantime, medical officials warn to always wash your hands, cover your mouth when you cough, and stay home if you're sick. In Washington, Eric Phillips. Palestinians have rejected President Trump's long-awaited Middle East peace plan. Palestinians intensified their protests against the proposal today, which would force them to make more concessions than Israel. The plan strongly favors Israel, but also paves the way for the possibility of a Palestinian state with limited sovereignty. The Palestinian president projected the plan with a thousand no's. Seth Doan has more from the West Bank. Here in Ramallah, this is certainly not being viewed as the deal of the century. In fact, it is not even being viewed as a deal worth protesting. Despite calls and predictions for widespread protests across the Palestinian territories, we have seen very limited protesting, a little bit of rock throwing in places like Bethlehem, but absolutely nothing like we have seen on, in the past. People are, Palestinians are out on the streets here, but they're out on the streets shopping, coming home from school, going about life pretty much as normal. That is because here among Palestinians, this so-called peace deal is being seen as incredibly one-sided. 
pro-Israeli and more for Israeli domestic political, cons political consumption than actually searching for peace. Of course, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is not only facing an election, but he is also facing a trial on corruption charges. Here, this is not being seen as a peace deal at all. Palestinians see this as more of a dud. Seth Doan, CBS News, Ramallah. News overnight, the Pentagon now revealing 50 American service members suffered traumatic brain injuries in that Iran missile attack, a dramatic increase from previous reports. Our chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raditz, has more on all this. Good morning, Martha. Good morning, Robin. The power of those cruise missiles striking that base in Iraq is still being felt. This morning, the Pentagon now saying 50 U.S. service members have been diagnosed with traumatic brain injury from that Iranian missile attack. That's nearly five times what was originally announced, with eight of those injured serious enough to be sent home to the U.S. for treatment. Their conditions didn't improve. Some got worse and some had severe enough symptoms that they were uh, transported on for further treatment. They will continue to receive treatment uh, in the United States either uh, at Walter Reed or at their home bases. The symptoms include headaches, dizziness, sensitivity to light, restlessness, and nausea. Symptoms that President Trump, who initially said there were no injuries, dismissed. No, I don't consider them very serious injuries relative to other injuries that I've seen. Those comments sparking outrage among some veterans groups, the VFW calling on the president to apologize for those, quote, misguided remarks. 31 of those who were injured have been returned to duty, but traumatic brain injury has impacted hundreds of thousands of service members since 9-11. Amy? Uh, thank you so much, Martha Raddatz. Despite President Trump saying he was going to withdraw troops from Iraq, it looks like just the opposite is actually happening. RT's Farron Franzak is joining us now with more to this. So Farron, there are new reports we're hearing that potentially three new bases might be built? Yeah, that's exactly right, Manila. According to breaking defense news and Israeli officials, the U.S. is building at least three semi-permanent new bases very close to the Iranian border in northern Iraq. Now, after the assassination of Iranians top, or Iran's top general, uh, Qasem Soleimani, the Iraqi parliament passed a non-binding resolution calling for the withdrawal of U.S. troops. But since that was passed, instead of withdrawing, there's indications that the U.S. military presence will become even greater. Now, take a look at this map. Here is where the U.S. plans to establish these three military bases, one near the city of Suleimania, a large base near the city of ha um, ha Halabja, and that's just eight miles from the Iranian border, and a third one that's planned a bit south from the city of Erbil. Now, with the U.S. building these bases, one Israeli expert says that the U.S. has realized, in spite of the president's declaration, they have to keep a real presence in doing it by building bases in Kurdish areas. This was expected by anyone who understands the strategic region, but one defense expert says that keeping troops in the region and building more only creates more tension. There's nothing that we can do there to improve American security. All we can do is be targets. And as we continue to do operations in both of these two countries, the chances of attack go up. Now, while the U.S. is building bases, NATO is also planning to boost the number of training and military personnel in Iraq. This after President Donald Trump called out NATO, telling them to do more in the Middle East. Now, in a proposal that has gained a lot of support from NATO members, trainers would be reassigned to its mission from the U.S.-led global coalition against ISIS, which is right now outside of NATO structures. Now, the proposal has to be approved by NATO defense ministers at their scheduled meeting next month. NATO had roughly 500 trainers, advisors, and support staff in Iraq until the mission was put on pause after the U.S. killed Soleimani. Now, NATO officials couldn't give exact numbers on how many service members could be joining this new mission, but allies say any changes to this NATO mission should be agreed on with the Iraqi government, Manila. But now, Farron, when it comes to Iraq's anti-government protests, they are continuing, and the Shia leader who was once in support of these protests I guess now he's gone the other way and he's mm -hmm. against them. What more can you tell us about that? Well, Manila, overnight we know at least two protesters were killed after unknown gunmen and pickup trucks shot at them. Those deaths now bring the total number of deaths from the ongoing <coughs> clashes to 12. Now, since uh, Friday clashes between protesters and security forces in Tahrir, Tahrir Square, with tear gas and even live ammo being fired on these protesters and their tents being set on fire, all to try and force them out. But like you mentioned, the influential Shia leader, Muqtada al-Sadr, in the 
past gave tremendous support to his followers in Baghdad, even called on the Million Man March on Friday and has been vocal about shutting down all American military bases and posts in Iraq. But now he's withdrawn his support for the movement, saying that he couldn't support the destruction of property. Still, tens of thousands of his supporters crowded a Baghdad neighborhood Friday, calling for Iraq to remove all U.S. and Iranian troops. Now, al sadr's withdrawal has his supporters packing up their tents and leaving, which anti-government protesters say left them open to attacks by security forces on their sit-ins. Reporting in Washington, Farron Franzak, RT. And I have a breaking news report. In regards to Israel, apparently, Palestinians have fired at least one mortar shell at southern Israel on Wednesday night, striking an open field but causing no injuries or damages. The mortar attack triggered sirens all across the region. A spokesperson said that an explosion was heard following the sirens and that an impact site was found in an open field outside the community. In the meantime, Israel has responded and confirmed via social media that its forces conducted several strikes against Hamas targets in the southern Gaza Strip late on Wednesday evening. In a translated statement, the IDF clarified that the attacks carried out by the IDF aircraft and fighter jets came about as a response to the rocket fire and explosion of bombs from the Gaza Strip toward Israeli territory. Also stating that the Hamas terror organization is responsible for what is happening in and out of the Gaza Strip and will have consequences for actions against Israeli citizens. And throughout Wednesday, a number of balloon clusters carrying suspected explosive devices that had been launched from the Gaza Strip landed in southern Israel, continuing a trend of these airborne attacks from the enclave over the past few weeks. Earlier on Wednesday evening, the military announced it was deploying additional troops to the Gaza border in the West Bank amid concerns that the Palestinians may respond violently to the peace plan. The military stated that in accordance with the constant situational assessments being conducted by the IDF, it was decided to reinforce the number of combat troops in Judea and Samaria Division and the Gaza Division. So definitely a very serious situation, but at the same time, not unexpected due to the peace plan unveiling just yesterday. And as it is a bombshell report that's hardly getting any traction, but it should be. An antivirus program used by hundreds of millions of people around the world is selling highly sensitive web browsing data to many of the world's biggest companies. Every search, every click, every buy, on every site. Now, the report by Vice obtained leaked user data, contracts, and other company documents showing that the sale of this data is both highly sensitive and in many cases it's supposed to remain confidential between the company and the client buying it. And some of those clients are pretty well known. The Home Depot, Google, Microsoft, and Pepsi. Well, to talk more about this, joining me now we have investigative journalist Ben Swan. Ben, thanks so much for taking the time yeah. to talk to me today. So. Break down again kind of what this report found and what more that you can add. Yeah, so essentially what the report found was that uh, uh, antivirus slash search engine mm -hmm. uh, called Avast was essentially taking user data on, as you said, over 100 million people, compiling all this data and, and doing it down to a granular level to the point where they knew exactly what websites people would browse, how often they're browsing, you know, the, the pattern they would use in which they were browsing. It was compiling data based on those search habits uh, approximating someone's age and their income. Uh, it was tracking every single thing, including, you know, people's activity on porn sites that could actually go down to which video and which searches they were oh looking boy. for. Compi <laughs> right, compiling oh all boy. this information, then taking all that information and turning around and selling it to through a, through a separate subsidiary called Jackpot and using that to sell it to major corporations, as you mentioned, like Home Depot and Pepsi. And so when they're selling this, essentially what they're doing is saying, you can compile these massive uh, lists of consumer habits, what consumers are looking for, what consumers want. The problem is, is that many of the people who have this antivirus software were not opting in, at least not consciously opting in, didn't realize that they were opting into this. So they didn't know that their information and their data was being taken, cataloged, and then sold. Now, this isn't the first time that we've heard something like this. Right. I mean, Facebook was the one, the catalyst that kind of opened up Pandora's box when it comes to this. Yes. But are we in an age now, do you think, Ben, where no matter what, we just have to assume that our data is going to be sold to somebody or our data is out there and people will be able to see it? Yeah, to some extent, I think we do because this is what internet businesses are, right? Mm -hmm. So when an antivirus company comes along and says, we are an antivirus company, they're actually not an antivirus company. Mm -hmm. They're a data collection and then 
profiteering company. Uh, that's what so many of these companies are. Now in this case, for instance, the antivirus company was free. So you go online and you say, I want to get software that's free. Anybody who's selling you, in, well, not selling you, but giving you anything for free online mm -hmm. is actually collecting your data. And some places that are charging you are also collecting your data. Mm -hmm. But that is the value of what's online. It's all data collection. So remember, I, I remind people all the time, when it comes to online, you are the product. You are the thing that's being bought and sold uh, every time that you, you get online. So you just need to be aware of that when you're online. And you know, they had, the, the, the company said that much of the data that they were taking, um, that people were remaining anonymous, that you know, names and stuff like that weren't really mm -hmm. being shown. Which is true. They, yeah, they said they were looking more at the numbers, but is that really believable? I mean, what what is the bigger danger here? Well, too? the the reality is, as an individual, so that they are correct when they say, you know, it wouldn't have your name beside it. However, anybody really who was really digging into this data could track the IP address and then ultimately match that IP address with a user. So it's not never a you know you're completely anonymous. We're just looking at your habits. That's not accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get deeper into it than that. On the other hand, no, it's not a you know Farron was doing this at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not going to be that obvious and that clear. But I think the bigger question is when we look at internet is how much are we being manipulated by these Fortune 500 companies that are buying this data. Essentially, they're trying to buy the data for what purpose? What is the value to them? Well, the value to them is to say, we want to know how people react, how people behave. And, and so a lot of it starts to become, at a certain point, social engineering, where mm -hmm. everything you're seeing online isn't authentic or organic, it's being contrived based upon what data says people are doing. And therefore, it becomes almost a self-feeding loop. But playing devil's advocate here, isn't that the purpose of business is they want to, you know, help their customers and bring, you know, what the customers want to them? Yeah. Isn't this kind of helping that? So, so the positive of it would be, yes, mm -hmm. uh, a, a company could come along and say, look, we're just trying to be the best that we can be and give people what they want. Great. If you do that, then let the customer know that that's what you're doing. When you're shopping or you're browsing online or you're, whatever you're doing, you should have the the right to, the authority to opt in or opt out. And what's instead happening is it's like a company says, I want to know what your habits are. So I'm peeking through your window and I'm watching everything you do inside your house and you don't know I'm there. I'm just monitoring you because I really want to help you. Well, yeah. I think I'd turn around and say, I'm going to close the window and I don't need that help that bad. And yeah. that's what it comes down to, opt in or opt out. Yep, all about transparency. Ben Swan, thanks so much. We'll see you on Boom Bus later today. Fair thanks. thanks. Justice is taking groundbreaking action to crack down on hundreds of millions of scam robocalls. We hate those things. It's filing for temporary restraining orders against U.S. telecom carriers, allegedly facilitating those fraudulent calls. Now, most of them originate in India, and older Americans are losing millions of dollars a year. Today, the Senate will hold a hearing to look into what it called the number one scam in America, social security fraud. Our consumer investigative correspondent, that's Anna Werner, spoke to one witness all set to testify. Unfortunately, Anna, a lot of people can relate to this. Good morning to you. Good morning. Yeah, in the past three months, the Social Security Administration says it's gotten more than 115,000 complaints about the social security scam. Now, some people likely never lost money. But this Utah woman and her husband lost more than most Americans make in a year. It truly is embarrassing. I'm embarrassed. I'm really embarrassed. Michelle Anderson and her husband Kyle, a Utah state representative, say they know many people won't be able to believe they became victims of the Social Security scam. But they say the fact they did means others need a warning. Maybe it happened to us so that we could help others. The scam started in December when Michelle says she got calls like this one. Your social has been found some suspicious for committing fraudulent activities. Claiming her social security number had been compromised and had been used to set up multiple bank accounts associated with a drug cartel. She says a man claiming to be a DEA investigator then said her family was in danger. He continued to talk to me about the danger that my family was in if I didn't cooperate, that these people were very um, dangerous, that they were watching me, that I needed to do what I was told. And so, not tell anybody, right? And not tell anyone. 
Not only that, she says he told her she needed to transfer all the money in the family's bank accounts to an offshore account that would be safe before the fraudulent accounts were seized or she would lose all of their money. To prove it, he sent her this, what he said was a warrant for her arrest for drug trafficking and money laundering that would be used if she didn't show full cooperation. So I drove to the credit union and I transferred uh, all of our money into our checking account. We had CDs. I, I cashed them in. I paid the penalties. All told, after a week's time, she wired $150,000 to the crooks. It was only after the scammer asked her to take out a mortgage on their home that the light finally dawned. And she told her husband something awful had happened. And she said, I have, I have given away every penny that we have. Uh, I felt like throwing up. You know, I just, I mean, I just felt this, this gut punch and uh, I felt sick. I was asked by someone, how could you be so stupid that at the time that I was going through it, it was very real. That's our population ages that the matter's only going to get worse. Seniors have lost nearly $38 million to the scam, says Senator Susan Collins. Oftentimes, our seniors are embarrassed when they realize that they've been ripped off and they're too ashamed to admit uh, that they've lost out their life savings to a scammer. They shouldn't be embarrassed. They should report this. The Andersons say they'll survive the dollar loss, but others may not. We don't want anyone else to go through this. A lot of people, since this has happened to us, have gotten those calls and called us and said, I just got a social security call, what should I do? <laughs> and we say, hang up. That is the thing to do, just hang up. But these scam calls just got even scarier. The FBI put out a warning yesterday saying the crooks are now spoofing the FBI's phone number to run scams. So when they call, it looks like they're calling from the FBI. Oh. Then they tell you to buy gift cards, which of course, do the FBI do. will, will never, never ask you to do. The FBI is not going to call you, people. Please don't yeah, call for this. Yeah. These scams are all kinds of wrong. I mean, yeah, they're, they're more than criminal. They're evil. They're very I mean, elaborate. They're just... First, I don't put the Andersons in the senior category. They yeah. So <laughs> yeah, no. One. I'm, I'm sorry that she feels so embarrassed because I think in the moment, you feel scared. Yep. You don't yeah. feel, you You have no idea that this is a scam. Well, you feel so, embarrassed in the end that you've been taken. Yeah, but, but, but in but the it, moment, you scary. are really scared. So Somebody what can we do? says they're the government. You're you, scared. You believe them. You know, these scammers are pros. They yes. are pros Very at good. panicking people and keeping them on the hook. Yeah. This went on for nearly a week. Yeah. And you think, that's not going to happen to me. I'm not going to be that stupid. And, and Guess I'm, what? It happens. It so happens what do you do? Me. You reach out Hang up. Well, yeah, but hang, hang up. When they say yeah. stay on the phone, don't call your, don't tell your husband, don't. No, do tell your husband, do tell your family, do call the local police, yeah. hang up, and guess what? If the government really needs to talk to you, they'll find they're gonna you. send they'll you a letter in the mail, yeah. certified mail, and say oh. you need to call us. So they'll yeah. never just call you on the phone. No. Not gonna no. call you. Once that money's money. gone, it's not okay. coming back. It's not no. like a credit card company's paying it back, and that's the worst thing about it. Evil is the right word. Yeah. Anna, thank you yeah. very much. Tell us about about. Yes, I have. I've got lots to tell you. Go on, just give us. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Is that your reaction to what people who want you off the spotty shortlist? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And what about you being stripped of your belt? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, uh, you must be very unhappy with that. What's your reaction to that? Jesus loves me and he loves you too and he loves you too. He loves these people in here and he loves everybody in the world. You th All you've got to do is repent of your sins and you will be, get, be forgiven. And do you think you can win spotty? Do you want to win spotty? John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him shall have eternal life and shall not perish. Okay, Tyson, uh, any, final, any final message to those people who have criticised you in recent? There's been a lot of criticism from people in signing petitions to the Scottish national people, to all sorts of yes, people. Yes, yes. Just, give us, just give us your take on it. Do you stand by your comments? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Okay, Tyson. The only way is through Jesus into heaven. That's all I can say. The A to Z, the Alpha, the Omega. Tyson. Jesus is the way, the key, and the only way into heaven. Okay, Tyson. Thank Peace you out. so much. Thanks for stopping. Thank you.